Welcome to the Internet of Things track. Uh, thanks for coming to my talk. Um, my name is Damien George. I'll give uh, a brief um, history of me so that you can understand where I'm coming from uh, before I go into the talk. So I was actually born in Melbourne um, and did my PhD at Melbourne University in theoretical physics uh, and also computer engineering. Um, and then after finishing my PhD, I moved to Amsterdam um, and worked there in theoretical physics uh, in the Dutch Research Institute for, for Atomic Physics, uh, doing things like uh, extra dimensions and supersymmetry and cosmology and Higgs physics. Um, and then moved to Cambridge in the UK, worked at the University of Cambridge on similar things. Um, uh, yeah, more supersymmetry and uh, the Higgs was announced, the discovery of the Higgs particle at um, uh, the LHC in Geneva and uh, it was really great to be a physicist at that time to understand how um, the significance of such a discovery. Um, but during my time uh, at Cambridge University, I uh, decided to do a Kickstarter just to see what it was like um, and uh, re-implemented Python so it could run on uh, very small embedded systems. I'll talk all about this in the talk. Um, and that, that sort of took over my life and I transitioned slowly from being a physicist to being a, uh, I guess, a Pythonist or a computer scientist. I, I do not really know what I am anymore. I'm just a mix of, of scientist and researcher and programmer. Um, but it's all a lot of fun and in this talk I'll tell you a bit about the Internet of Things and how Python uh, through MicroPython can become a big part of the Internet of Things hopefully. Um, please do ask questions during the talk just uh, and, and, and we can have a discussion. There's lots of time for talking about things if you want to ask lots of questions. Um, I'm sure you all have different backgrounds and I'm not used to all the different backgrounds so if, if I'm skipping over something, just, just let me know and I'll explain it in more depth. Okay, so uh, as Lachlan said, the Internet of Things is this buzzword that maybe not many people understand, even the people who invented the word. I don't know who invented it, but I don't really know what the Internet of Things is. Um, but I, I try and understand it by saying that it's microcontrollers or little computers um, combined with wireless uh, communications or wireless connectivity. So you put these two things together um, and I think that's, that's really sort of the, 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 the ground of, of the Internet of Things, the, the basic hardware that underlies it. Um, and there are quite a few examples nowadays of the applications of using the Internet of Things, if you want to call it that, just um, little computers controlling things all over the place. So I mean, even, even your toaster might have a little computer in it, or, or maybe it's not that smart, but at least your washing machine and your fridge has a computer in it. And these days, more and more things have little computers in them, or microcontrollers. And if we connect them all together, they can all communicate, and you know, this is sort of the, the internet of things. So for example, lighting in homes. So I think this is, this is probably the first and really good example of, of a good application is, you know, you have your lights and you want to dim them or change their color for the mood and you can do that remotely with an app say or even with a dial on the wall but um, you're going to have to have a little microcontroller in the light which knows what the to, to adjust the intensity and the color um, and also another great uh, use of that is as an alarm so to say wake you up in the morning or your lights can turn on um, or to alarm you or notification of an email the lights can flash red in your house so things like this it, 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 um, things we haven't thought of before, um, which uh, the Internet of Things, I think, encompasses. Uh, heating and cooling of ho homes, so you know, adjusting your temperature via an app um, or before you come home. Uh, traffic monitoring, so these days, um, with more and more cars on the road, you can't really build bigger roads, at least in Europe, where it's very congested already. So the best thing you can do is to optimize traffic flow and the best way to do that is to first understand what the traffic flow is and then you can say, all right, can we change the lights here and here to let them go through? Or can we optimize this lane so that it's only for cars going, turning left, for example? Don't need the slides. Um, it's, it's, that's better. Okay. And okay. Uh, 
what else? Uh, farming. So I think, especially in Australia, where the farms are massive, um, you need a helicopter to go from you know the ranch to out to see where the cows are. Would be better if each cow had a little tracking device on them, and you know you're sitting at home in your ranch, and you're like, well, here is all my cows, and you know if one's maybe dead because it stopped moving for a day, for example. Um, so if each each cow had a little microcontroller, a GPS tracker, and connecting to you know using some long range, say LoRa uh, wi wireless technology to your base station, uh, it's very very feasible. Um, monitoring water levels and so on. These are all really practical, useful applications which help um, to you know improve efficiency, say in farms or in traffic. Um, so they're not just well, let's make our fridge connect to the internet for some random reason. Uh, logistics as well, so real-time tracking of containers. If, if, you if you've, you're a logistics company and you want to track all of your goods, a movement of goods from all A to B uh, around the world, and you put a tracker in each pallet, say, you can monitor the temperature and the vibration and how long it's been sitting here and so on. And, and you can have really good information about where things are. So again, it improves efficiency um, in the systems. So you can keep these things in mind when you're thinking about the Internet of Things. There's many, many other examples, but uh, these are just a few that I could think of. Okay. So uh, in these examples that I just gave, what, what is the, what is one of the things that's uh, ubiquitous is the, the end nodes, so the sort of the fingertips of the Internet of Things. So on, on the left is just a temperature sensor, uh, which is connecting wirelessly to some other base station, say. And in the diagram here, the, the circles are, are depicting the end nodes, which is sort of the, more, the most important part, because they're the thing that collects the data, like the temperature, or the GPS location of something, or the number of cars passing through your freeway. Um, or also, they can be the actuators, so they turn the lights on in your house or change the heating control. So you've got sensors and actuators, which can, you know, you can have both on the one node, or just one, or just the other. Um, and they all connect via maybe some hubs, which are these hexagon shapes, um, back to the real internet, which is depicted by that uh, red thing. So these end nodes, as you can see, um, you have the most of them. And the hubs are sort of just you know, the, the thing that gets things working, but the, the, that connects things together. But the, the end nodes are the important things, because without them, it doesn't work. Um, and so these are the things that we need to build and program um, and the problem with, well, one of the problems and also one of the benefits is that these end nodes are getting more and more complicated. So this diagram here, you don't expect you to read any of the text or anything, but it's, a, um, it's, a, it's an overview of how the microcontroller works um, in, one of, in the Pi board, the one thing which MicroPython runs on, uh, which we'll talk about later. Um, but this is just the sense, so the CPU is a tiny little box up in the top left corner. Um, and the other things are like timers and GPIO ports and UARTs and ADC converters and DAC converters, so to convert voltages to digital and back and forth. Um, and this thing, you know, 10 years ago, this diagram would have been a quarter of or an eighth of the size and you could understand it and you would program it in assembler and it would be relatively easy to do. Um, and you would, you know, you would turn a light on and you would turn it off. And you would turn it on and off and there'd be no wireless connectivity um, but it was really simple. But these days, the microcontrollers are very, very complicated. They have DMA and IRQs, and you've got, you know, how, how do you understand how to use all of these things? Um, not only are the microcontrollers themselves, so like the, the computer bits complicated, but the attachments, the sensors and the actuators are getting more and more complicated as well. So, you know, you all probably have a smartphone with an accelerometer in it that detects the angle. Um, these accelerometers are also very complicated, you know, microelectromechanical um, sensors, um, very sophisticated, uh, and you can do lots of stuff with them. You can adjust the sensitivity, you can make them interrupt you when they feel like they're falling, um, and you can you can do many things with these thing with these sensors, um, and they're communicating via an I2C bus or an SPI bus, which requires specific timing levels and sending the right commands. So things get more and more complicated, but also more advanced. You have all these great features. You have GPS, and you have um, these accelerometers, and you know fancy RGB lights, which can go to 16 million different colors. Um, and 
so to use all of these things successfully um, and to be able to program them to make them do the things we want to do, uh, it takes a lot longer now if you're developing an application. Now, we know from the PC side of things, so just your laptop or your desktop, that you know, many, many years ago we wrote an assembler or C, low level C, and the applications were simple and, 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 and you did things that way. But nowadays, with the web and with really fast computers and with lots of sophisticated um, um, things you can do, I mean, what language do you use to program computers these days? You use, you use Python, yes, exactly. <laughs> or you use you know, other things like Java or, or Go or, or you know, all these new languages that are coming out. But you use a much more higher level language um, because it allows you to have better productivity and get more out of the hardware. So yes, the higher level language sometimes uses more resources, but you're trading off your computer programmer time here. So time to actually produce something. If you want to make it, I mean, in the olden days, you know, many, many, 40 years ago, you could, because your computing resources were so expensive, you could spend many, many man months developing and optimizing the assembler code so that it would run efficiently. But these days, it's the other way around. You spend the money on the hardware and the, the programmer is expensive. So you only want them to program for, say, an hour to make something work. And so using a high level language, even if it's not as efficient in execution, is the way to go. Um, so that's the argument for high level languages and we're applying that now to these microcontrollers. So their complexity is increasing. Um, to fully understand one of these diagrams and, and, and really make the most of all the hardware in assembler is really, really tough. No one even programs these in assembler anymore, really. You use C or C++ at the very minimum, maybe with a sprinkle of assembler here and there. But um, even to understand it in C, uh, there's lots and lots of tricks uh, that you have to learn and you know you might have your program running okay but then for some reason the DMA is slow uh, and you've got to understand why and you've got to synchronize the, everything, the timers. So let's try and use a high level language like Python instead to provide a better programming experience for these devices. Um, so it's easier to, for you to read code then um, if you see, you know, it says gpio.on, you understand what's going on there and you know how to change it to say gpio.off. Um, the abstraction of hardware is better because uh, you're encapsulating a complicated thing like a, a, an analog to digital converter in an object which you can just read the value from. And you can then hopefully make your scripts portable to another microcontroller that has a totally different architecture. but it has the same Python bindings, the same Python API for all of the peripherals, you know, roughly the same. So your knowledge is much more transferable to other microcontrollers. Um, unlike in C, it's, it's much harder to go from one, say from a, one vendor to another vendor, like from Nordic to uh, ST. They have completely different architectures in their chips. But if you have a high level language which exposes the same API on the two chips, then you know how to program lots of different things. Um, rapid prototyping, it's much easier to you know, get something working straight away using Python than it is using C, because there's, no, um, there's no compilation. You have a prompt, and you can just turn lights on and off at the prompt. Uh, I mean, I'll show demos of this later on. Um, oh yeah, and we can reuse libraries. So Python is known to have, well, is famous, I guess, for having everything probably also the kitchen sink included in all of its libraries. And those are pretty much then portable to your microcontroller. So if you need to, you know, serialize using JSON, you can do it, you know how to do it. Or, you know, you don't have to learn another way of serializing in JSON. Um, okay, so this is the argument for scripting languages. Are there any questions or comments so far? Okay. So I'm going to go through, I know this is a Python conference, but I'm going to go through a few other scripting languages just because we're open-minded people and uh, explain, you know, what the state, of it, the state of the art is for these other languages as well. So Lua is probably the more no, well-known language for embedding. So it's used a lot in games to script games. Um, and eLua is a version of Lua which is made for embedded systems, hence the E, embedded Lua. Um, 
and it's sort of an optimized version of Lua so that it's a bit uses less RAM and it also includes uh, the ability to run on microcontrollers directly and control the hardware like turn lights on and off or turn GPIO on and off for example. Um, there's a snippet here just in case you haven't seen Lua before of, of, a, of a factorial function um, and down the bottom there's how to say turn uh, a pin on and off using uh, using the functions. So it's it's a rather, so it's a simple language, which I guess is a pro because it's not hard to learn. And it's also a pro because it means it's, it's, it will fit easily on a microcontroller and doesn't use too much memory. And it's quite lightweight and fast and efficient when it's running. So yeah, Lua is a very, is a very, a very small language um, with a nice implementation. Um, and that's, I guess, also a con in that the, being a simple language, you sort of get to the boundaries very quickly and um, you know, there's, there's not much room to move and to do more advanced things. I mean, it, it, has, it has closures and it has uh, objects. You've got to sort of implement them yourself a little bit. Um, but it's definitely not as big and as powerful as language as Python, for example. Um, it doesn't really have integers either. Everything is a floating point, um, although this was recently fixed in a very new version of Lua. Um, and there's no native bitwise operations. So, for example, on a microcontroller, you often want to do, you often want to do AND or 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 XOR operations because you're working with bits a lot of the time, and they're very natural um, operations to use. And in Lua, well, they've actually only just recently introduced these bitwise operations, whereas in Python, for example, they've been there since I think the beginning. Um, and eLua is currently being used. I think it became most popular in IoT with the this ESP8266 chip, which you'll hear a lot about in the next couple of hours from me and the next speaker. Um, and yeah, it, this Node MCU is sort of the brand, um, and they used eLua to provide really simple Wi Fi uh, uh, programming on this ESP chip. Um, so that's Lua. The next language is, uh, you could probably have guessed, JavaScript. So, I mean, I guess JavaScript is probably the most popular language, and that's by um, default, I guess, because you've got to use it to program the internet. Uh, but JavaScript has also seen a lot of uh, work in making it run in, smaller, in small places with low memory and on microcontrollers as well. Um, for me, probably the most, well, the most uh, important one is Esperino, which is, um, so, the creator Gordon Williams is a, a friend, a friend of mine, I guess, and because uh, he was in the UK, and he he wrote Esperino, which is a a version of JavaScript that runs on microcontrollers, and he did a Kickstarter to sort of get it out there and and um, and produce this board that you can see on the left, uh, and did very well. And it was sort of he he beat he beat MicroPython maybe by it was maybe three or four months. Um, in the Kickstarter. So I was very nervous when I saw his. I'm like, wow, he's done what I was about to do, and he's done it with JavaScript, um, and now I have to compete with Python. But no, I think it's great having two different languages um, evolving together. So people have an option. People also see that, hey, scripting languages on microcontrollers is not this just one small thing. Actually, lots of languages are trying to do it now. Um, and we can all also learn from each other. Um, you know, the JavaScript has things we can learn from, and Python has things they can learn from us. So there's been a lot of good um, cross-fertilization, I guess you could say, between the languages. Um, there's other things, JerryScript, which is sponsored by Samsung, which is a rewrite of JavaScript to be efficient. But um, I think Esperino runs in smaller places than JerryScript, although JerryScript has a lot of active development at the moment. Tessel is another one. Duct tape is an embeddable JavaScript. And I think there's even more. Um, you can look those websites up if you're interested. Um, and here in blue is a little example from Esperino of how to make an LED flash randomly. Um, you, can, you can look at that and understand it yourselves. Um, I guess the pros about JavaScript is it's a very popular language, as you know. And it has a large community, lots of online presence for learning. People already know it, I guess. Um, and it's a simple language, but it's still, very, it's, I think it's more powerful than Lua, but, but it's still very simple in its description. Um, the cons, well, there are some very crazy semantics in JavaScript about coercion of objects and um, 
understanding the scope of things, enclosures. Uh, it's all callback based. You, you might say that's a pro, it could be a pro, but it means that your code ends up really messy if you have a, long, a big program because you have to say, well, when someone connects this socket, do this callback, but if there's an error, do this callback, and then the state will change, and then I want to change the callback. And it, 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 Unlike Python, for example, which is more procedural in its flow. Um, the other thing with JavaScript is that all numbers are floats. So I mentioned this with Lua, but so the, the problem with all numbers being floats, so that in, in JavaScript, if, if you do one, it, it, it's one, that's, that's, that's good. But it's actually stored as a double internally, a double precision floating point number. And if I do one plus one, I'll get two. If I do two plus one, I'll get three. But if I keep adding, eventually it won't work anymore. So if I have you know, 10 to the nine plus one, it just stays 10 to the nine, or uh, I think it's a bit less, more than that. But um, you eventually can't add one anymore because it's storing it as a double precision number. Um, and this is not really good, I don't think, for microcontrollers because you want things to be precise and, and you want to be able to sort of count you know, events, the number of cars passing by, and you don't want to roll over at a billion cars or you know, not be able to add anymore. Um, for example, in Python, uh, there is a good distinction between floats and integers, and the integers are arbitrary precision. So I can keep adding one forever. I use more and more memory, but I can keep adding one. Um, and so uses in the IoT at the moment. So as I said, the Esperino is being used. It had, there's a, this Puck.js, which is a recently uh, third Kickstarter of Gordon's. Um, there's a little Bluetooth thing which allows you to you know, press a button and remotely control something. Um, there's also this ESP board which runs Esperino and other JavaScript implementations. The TESOL boards have built-in Wi-Fi. So there, there's been a lot of work with JavaScript and the Internet of Things. And this is just on the sort of the end nodes. I mean, there's also a lot more with Node.js on the back end and stuff, but um, we're just talking about the nodes here. Any questions? Okay, uh, the, the last language here on this list um, is Ruby, which uh, has also seen a lot of use in the internet with Ruby on Rails development. Um, and there's this, it's, it's kind of small in the font, but MRuby uh, is a lightweight implementation of, of the Ruby language, um, which can be embedded in other applications. And also, the idea is so that it can run on microcontrollers, but there's no support yet for it. Although this is quite a popular, MRuby is quite popular because it was sponsored by the Japanese government for development. Um, it hasn't really seen use on microcontrollers yet. Um, but, I mean, Ruby is a, nice, is a nice language. So maybe it will see more use in the future. Okay. Just, uh, what's the time? All right. So now, of course, uh, we're at a Python conference, so uh, we have to talk about Python, but that's, that's the main reason I'm here. So what about Python or microcontrollers? Well, so that was my question. Uh, almost, uh, yeah, three years ago, I guess. Um, is it possible to make Python run on a microcontroller? Now, why, why is that a hard thing to do? Uh, it's because Python uses a lot of memory, and it's, it's quite a large program. It's a large language. It has lots of features, lots of libraries, lots of built-in stuff you can do with it. As you know, I mean, I'm, I'm sure all of you have used Python before, or maybe not, but if it's, um, it does have a lot of features, so that makes it hard to make it run in a small, constrained environment. So just to give you an example, the, um, the amount of code space we're talking about is about 256 kilobytes. So 256K is your entire sort of um, hard drive space, as it were. And the amount of RAM, say, 64 kilobytes of RAM. So that's how much RAM you have to play with for everything, for your stack and for your heap. Um, so those are the sorts of numbers we're talking about when we want to run these languages on, um, on these chips. Um, and I don't know if I have to motivate Python for this, for this audience, but uh, here is a list of things that, that I can use to motivate uh, people, say, who uh, like JavaScript. I can say that you know, Python is a very high level language with lots of really awesome features like closures, uh, list comprehension, and generators, and really advanced exception handling. Um, has massive library, which is really great. So once you've learned the library, you know how to do lots of stuff very quickly. 
the community is really amazing. It's very big. Uh, conferences all around the world like this, like this one. Um, a very friendly community and lots of online presence, lots of learning tools for students, for all, you know, a whole range of people. Um, I think Python is very easy to learn. In fact, it was, um, so Python was actually invented by a Dutch person, Guido, who you know, um, who, actually, who actually next door where I worked in Amsterdam, uh, there was the information center next door to the physics uh, center. Um, but it, that was long before I was there. Uh, uh, and he, uh, Guido, when he designed Python, he wanted to make it easy for teaching people. He wanted it to be a teaching language. So he made it very sim you know, simple to understand. But as time has gone on, it's also become a very, very powerful language. And I think, I think Python, what I would say, has a very, very shallow but a very long learning curve. So you can jump on and start very easily. But as you go, you learn more and more. And even 10 years later, you're still learning and going up this curve and understanding you know, the advanced meta classes and all these libraries um, that you know, are hidden in the back. So, I think it's a great language for beginners and advanced users. I mean, even today, I still, there's still things I learn about Python, even though I've implemented a version of it. Um, so I think it's a, it's a good language for those reasons. Um, and yeah, it's also, it's also pretty good for microcontrollers because native bit was operations, good separation between floating point and integers, which is important. Um, really robust exception handling, which is important in these environments because you know, you want your light to always turn on when you turn on, when you, when you press the on button. You don't want it to crash. Um, and so it's important to be able to handle exceptions well. Okay, so the, I guess the question is why can't we just take normal Python and run it on a microcontroller? Um, or the other version of, normal, of Python, uh, like PyPy. So C Python is the normal Python that most people use um, on, on your PC when you run Python. Now, the problem, the problem with CPython running on a microcontroller is that it just uses a lot of memory. That's really the main thing. Uh, it, for example, every integer, like the number one, takes uh, 16 bytes of, of memory, of heap memory, um, because it's got to have a pointer to its type, being an integer, a reference count, and then the actual value. Um, and when Python starts up, it actually creates all of the integers from minus five to plus 256, um, so that they're efficient, they're already there, because you know, those numbers are most commonly used. Normally I, I do you know, one plus one, and then I get two, and those numbers are already there, they're already created for me, um, so it's not slow to create them. But it means that you use about four kilobytes of memory just to start up to create the numbers. Um, and there's a lot more memory that's used to import modules and build the, um, the, the initial dictionaries for lots of different things. So when Python starts up, it uses a lot of memory. I'm not quite sure what the number is, but I know at least that it uses 4K just for the integers. And on a microcontroller, that's not really acceptable. Um, when you do a method call, if you do led.on, it actually it takes the LED object, extracts the on method, and then creates a bound method object which you then call. So there's this intermediary object which is allocated in memory, um, which, which takes about 20 bytes, as I've written here. So to do LED.intensity 1000, I have to allocate the number 1000, and I have to allocate an object for the LED.intensity method. And so I'm using 36 bytes of RAM just to do this little operation. Um, so 36 bytes of RAM is not too much, but if you're running this thousands of times per second, or even millions of times per second, if you want to try and um, run it at its full speed, you're going to churn through RAM very quickly and have to run the garbage collector um, again and again and again. It's not good. Um, so the idea is to get rid of these, um, well, is to change the way Python works so it doesn't have to do all of this. I mean, Python has been optimized. Uh, well, I wrote these slides probably a couple of years ago, and they're still true, although the LED.intensity example, I think they're introducing a new opcode so that that's optimized. Um, but that's very, very recent. Okay, so, I, so the aim with MicroPython was to make Python run on a microcontroller, and in the end it ended up being also useful for many other things like embedded systems, um, constrained environments like in space, uh, and Internet of Things. Um, I didn't really know about the Internet of Things a couple years ago when I started MicroPython, so, I mean, I was a physicist, I didn't know about any of these things, but uh, I gradually learned. 
Um, so the way that I approached MicroPython was as a Kickstarter because I thought that would be fun. And I thought it would be a way to see if people were interested in what I was doing. Um, and so on the 30th of April 2013, so yeah, that's about um, over three years ago, I, st I wrote the first line of code. Um, and then uh, in September of that year, I had a flashing LED when you, and, and also button presses uh, running on a board. Um, and then a month later, I had a, a prompt on the board and a file system, and you could plug it into USB. And it was all sort of minimum viable product, sort of working proof of concept at that point. Um, and then we made a video uh, for the Kickstarter, which you need to do. And you, know, you need to convince the world that your idea is very cool and that they should give you money to, to develop it. Um, and then the Kickstarter ran for 30 days at the end of 2013. And we got a very, very, very good response, much more than I expected. Um, and um, doing Kickstarter is a lot of energy, uh, re re responding to people. And um, uh, it was a lot more than I expected. I'm going to talk tomorrow a lot more about that. So I'll, sk I'll skip that over here. Um, but we raised about $180,000 when converted to Australian dollars. And then about two years later, in April 2015, I said it was officially finished, that I had done all the things that I said I was going to do. Um, but since then, we've done a lot more stuff as well. Um, so we, we manufactured boards, these Pi boards, in a factory in the UK. Um, and it was really great to go to a factory and see things being made. That was really fun. Um, oh, OK, so um, let me just see what the time is. OK. So I won't uh, spend too long explaining about all the details of how I made it MicroPython more efficient. But I didn't take Python and change things. I rewrote MicroPython from scratch. So every line of code was you know, written by me from, from the ground up. And the architecture was designed so that it wouldn't need memory to store integers. It, integers are stored in the pointer themselves using um, pointer tagging or, or um, pointer stuffing, if you know what that is, from Lisp. Um, and there's optimized method calls, so you don't need to use memory. Um, for loops don't you need memory if it's just a simple 4x in range. Um, most things like built-in modules, they live in read-only memory. So you don't need any RAM when you do import sys, for example, because it's just it just stays in, um, in ROM and it executes from ROM. So all of the design decisions for MicroPython were to reduce or eliminate memory usage where possible. Um, and I think um, I think we succeeded. So there's one of these, one device that runs on the micro bit, which is this BBC project we were involved in, uh, has 256K of, of read-only memory and only 16 kilobytes of RAM. Um, and the heap is actually only about 9.5 kilobytes. So in 9.5 kilobytes of RAM, you've got to do everything. Your scripts, you know, your prompt. Uh, so it's, I think it, run, it runs, runs pretty well. You can do sort of, you can do some stuff with that. Um, so it's on. It's developed on GitHub, and um, it's an open source project. It's MIT licensed. Anyone can go and download it and use it for whatever they like. Um, and I think using GitHub has been really great. We have lots of contributors. We get lots of people coming, submitting bug reports, and um, I think it's such a great thing to have an open sort of discussion about the code and how it's evolving. Um, I, I think GitHub has been done a great service to the open source community. Um, and I hope it sticks around and continues to do that. Um, but you know, there's all. I mean, Git is always independent of GitHub, so it can always be transferred um, because it's a distributed uh, version control system. So MicroPython has it's quite a lot of stars. It's quite popular, and um, that's yeah. It, it's it's nice to see people really uh, jumping on and helping. Um, and the more people we have that use it, the more robust the code gets, because people submit bug reports for, say, this ancient system with this old compiler has this error, and we can maybe fix it and then get it working on more more systems. OK. Um, so we actually then did a second Kickstarter after the first one, because you know one Kickstarter is not enough. Um, and this was based around this ESP chip. So ESP8266. Um, is just the, the name of a, of, of a chip made by Espressive, which is this Chinese company. Um, 
And so I'll give you a little background on, on this chip because this is what, well, this tracks about IoT and I think this is a, a good example maybe of, of how, it, um, of, the, of the, the ecosystem around microcontrollers. So normally in, so in China, well, they, they copy a lot of things from um, say the West, Western uh, technology and, and they do it to make things cheaply and, and efficiently but um, you don't usually hear about the things that they make. So, you know, a chip company might say, all right, I'm going to make a chip um, and to be able to turn on and off a light remotely via Wi-Fi. So I think that's actually what this ESP was for. They're like, we need to make it as quickly and cheaply as possible. So we'll use this open source component here. You know, we'll take this design here for the Wi-Fi. Um, we'll use this architecture for the chip, so it's an extensor architecture. And they bring all these components together. They don't worry about licensing or copyright because there's no laws, you know. I mean, that, but that this is not, I'm not saying this in a bad way. I'm saying I'm just, this is a different situation there. You know, in a country like Australia or, or in the UK or America, we have copyright laws so that people can design something and then hopefully get paid for what they did. Um, but in China, it doesn't work that way. People make stuff and get paid for making stuff, the design is sort of free in a sense. So it's just a different way of thinking about it. And so that, you know, these chip companies, they pull in all these ideas and then make a chip. And the idea is that it works for its single purpose and then it's sold for a dollar um, and then they go on making the next one. And they sell it probably to one consumer who's making lights out of it that connect via Wi-Fi. And they don't care as long as it works and, and the light turns on and off. They don't want to make this chip user friendly. Um, and, but what happened with the ESP chip is that it was so cheap and it had Wi-Fi that people from, I say, the West, in, just to encompass the other audience, um, they, they took this chip and said, wow, this is really cool. Let's reverse engineer it to see what it can really do. Um, and there was a really big effort. I mean, this started, it was about two years ago when it was, when it was first launched. And it was very, very quick for the community in a few months to get a compiler running and to understand the memory layout, um, be able to download new code um, and run the Wi-Fi. And so it was really picked up um, by the hackers of the world to you know, really take it forward and actually use it as a very, very cheap microcontroller. And Espressive, the Chinese company, they're like, well, you know, we don't really care or we don't want to support you or we're not going to give you documentation. And, but at the same time, you can do whatever you like with it because they don't, they don't have copyright um, um, laws to worry about. But over time, Espressive realized that they were onto something because it grew bigger and bigger. So they started providing support and documentation and improved firmware, like the code to do the Wi-Fi, and really built up a good relationship with the, the West to have this chip um, you know, into more ha hands of more people. And they started selling a lot more. Um, and yeah, I mean, it grew from there. Um, so coupled with that, which is sort of the hardware getting into the hands of people, um, there's also the software side of things. So I said before that it used Lua to run it um, initially, and that really got it into the hands of people who didn't know how to use microcontrollers. They're like, oh, I can just type wifi.connect, and I connect to my Wi-Fi, and then I can type gpio.io.write, and I can turn a light on. So you know, with a few lines of code, anyone could easily connect to the internet in a tiny little chip. So I think it was this combination of um, this, this really cheap chip the, uh, being reverse engineered by lots of hackers and then a scripting language like Lua on top of it that made it really popular. Um, and then, well, we thought MicroPython can also run on it. it it's sort of, it's just enough power, just enough memory to run Python as well. So. MicroPython was eventually ported to it, and we did this second Kickstarter campaign, which was a pure software campaign. So the first one we sold, well, we gave boards as part of the rewards. But with this second campaign, it was just, you know, we want to develop MicroPython to run really well on this chip, this ESP chip. You know, if you want to give 10 pounds, please do, and we'll try and make it even better. And we got a really amazing response of, uh, of almost $50,000. And yeah, software campaigns don't usually go so well, but we were overwhelmed. And it was great to see the community just saying, you know, yes, I support your, your uh, ongoing efforts. Um, and a lot of the work we've done to make it run on the ESP is also filtered back into just general MicroPython for other microcontrollers as well. Okay, so um, 
Okay, I've got about 15 minutes left. So I'm going to try and do some demos now to just to give you a real feeling for what, um, what I've just been talking about. But also please, yeah, uh, think of questions to ask and we can talk about, uh, we can talk about lots of different things. So now this is a live demo with Wi-Fi at a conference. So just, you know, it may not work. Uh, but I'll, I'll have, at least have something to show you. Um, I'll just plug it in, right. Make sure things. Um, I think the next speaker is going to talk a bit more about the hardware and plugging it in and stuff. But I'll, I'll just, for now, uh, so this, this is what, the, the chip is this silver thing and um, this board just provides you with more features like battery charger and stuff. But it's connected via USB and all the things I'm going to do here, I'll just see if I can connect. Okay, good. Can everyone see the prompt in the corner yet? Yeah? Yeah. Okay. So, um, I just have to explain that this, this, the chip runs Python and compiles and does everything on the, the chip. My PC, my laptop's not doing anything except sending and receiving characters like a dumb terminal, if you're familiar with that term. So, it just sends A, if I press A, sends A down the serial and then this, this, the, the MicroPython's like, well, what do I do with the A? Uh, well, there's typing at the prompt, so I'll have to respond and make the prompt look like he typed an A. But everything is done on the chip. The computer's not doing anything at all except just being a keyboard and a screen. All right, so we'll, let's just try some. Um, um, I think, yeah, you can all see that. So, I mean, one plus two is three. So this is just a Python prompt. Um, I know it's silly, but so how about uh, two to the power of 100, or how about four to the power of 100, or even 1,000? So, I mean, it's full, so you have full Python with, with big integers um, and floating point, for example. Um, so, math uh, sine of 0.4 is 0.3. So, what I've just done here, all of this is running and compiling on this little chip. Um, which has about uh, 32 kilobytes of RAM, and um, it has four megabytes of flash, but that's because, well, we put a lot of flash so you can have a file system. So for example, um, import OS, oops, import OS, os.lister. So there's some files there. Um, so I can do f equals open license f.read. So that's the MIT license. Um, on a file in the file system. So this little chip, we've used part of the flash memory actually to implement a file system as well. And you can store your scripts there, libraries, you can import stuff from there as well. Um, uh, so it's, it's, there's a lot of Python here. Um, what else can, I mean, uh, I can show you, so it has a garbage collector. Oh, well, I can collect garbage. <laughs> there, uh, MicroPython, there's a MicroPython module which can show you the memory layout. So just for those interested, uh, so okay, the total of 28 kilobytes of heap, we've used seven kilobytes, um, and this is just a pictorial representation. So those equals means it's all been used at the moment. But if I, um, most of that is actually for the file system, for a cache for the file system, but uh, anyway. So you can see all these things. Um, uh, there's a machine module uh, which is used to control the machine. So I can see what the frequency, we're running at 80 megahertz uh, and I can change it on the fly to say 160 megahertz. Uh, so we're now running at 160 megahertz um, on this little chip. So I'll just change it back to 80. Okay, so there's lots of, um, built-in features to use the hardware like this. Um, so what was, well, there's, lot, there's, there's, there's many things I can do, but because we're in IoT, we should do some internet things. Hopefully we have an IP address. Um, there's a network module. So, I, okay, there's um, tab completion and everything and history here, so that's why I can type quite fast. So I have naught, so, these are the methods, so what's my IF config? So this is my IP address. Um, I'm connected to the local network. 
uh, IP address on the left. Um, so what's the most uh, simplest way to use the internet in Python? The internet. Uh, what module would you use? Socket. socket, okay. So import socket. Oops, oops. Okay, let's get the um, IP address of what's your favorite website? Uh, Python.org. Hmm? Python.org, that poor 80. <laughs> Okay, so that's its IP address there. So we're, okay, the Wi-Fi is working, which is good. Um, all right, so let me show you a, a demo. Let me just um, bear with me. Nope. Uh, uh, con AU IoT demo. All right, you don't have to read this, but um, these are just all my demo things. Okay. All right. Okay, I'm just going to cut and paste this simple demo. So the other thing we have is a paste mode. So if you press Control E, there's paste mode, so I can just paste in some code. Uh, okay, there. So uh, this code here, so put socket, get the ad IP address of this website here. Um, Port 23 is the telnet port. So telnet is a very simple protocol. You just send and receive uh, basically data bytes. Um, and then I'm creating a socket connecting to my um, this server here. And then I'm in a loop. I'm just going to download 500 bytes or thereabouts and then print it out to the screen. So this is telnet. Telnet is so simple. You just, you just download bytes from it. Does, do people know what this does? Blinking lights, yeah, okay. So if I press Control D, it finished pasting. So here we're watching, we're gonna watch Star Wars in Ascumation. Uh, so what happens here is I'm just downloading text and printing it to the screen. And it just so happens that they put pauses between the download so you can watch a frame um, and they have new lines and clear screen so that it, it, um, it gives you an animation. So I'm just downloading and displaying text here. Uh, Depending on how good the Wi-Fi is, it depends how far we get before it uh, gives up. But um, so it would be nice if we got to some Star Wars bit, but uh, we'll see. Well, I've got a few more, 10 minutes. So, but you saw that this was just, the, this is, once you've connected to the Telnet server, this is just three lines. It's while true, socket.receive, and then print data. I mean, I could probably replace that with one line if I read it all on one line, but. Uh, we just have to see R2D2 and then we can stop it. <laughs> the IPv6 version? I don't think we support. Oh, I do. No, we don't have IPv6 on this thing. But if you do on your laptop, you can. The thing with MicroPython is that. The whole idea is to have the same code run in normal Python as in MicroPython. So, you know, it's not like we invented Socket 2 or something. We use, try and use the same socket, exactly the same API. So the code that I wrote here, you can run on your laptop and it will work exactly the same. So you can test all of your code offline, well, sort of on your laptop or PC. Um, and then if it works, you know, you put it on your ESP chip and it should work the same. <laughs> Okay, yeah, we okay. They've shut down the main reactor. All right, so control C. Okay, and we just stop our forever loop. Um, so, I mean, okay, this is uh, this is towards the end of the talk. I mean, I can keep going with many more demos, and I can answer lots of questions. Um, okay, so that means that we need to press reset. <laughs> okay. Uh, Yes, 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 yes. Inputs and outputs, and uh, so I can show you. Uh, let me just. Okay, I have demos to download URLs. Demos to do. Yeah, okay. Let me just. Um, so import machine, and then say pin, pin zero equals machine dot pin zero, and make it in uh, output mode. Okay, so um, the LED is connected in an inverted way. So when I do uh, pin zero dot value, when I do zero, it turns it off. No, 
turn, one turns it off, and zero turns it on. But you get, yeah, you get the picture, right? So, but that's how you, you do I/O. And then, if I want to make an input, I can say do, you know, uh, pin four equals machine dot pin four, and in input mode. So pin four dot value. So it's currently high, but if I put it made, if I connected something to it, I can read different values. So that's how you do I/O. Um, and there's lots of other. There's um, well, there yeah. There's there's an ADC um, for getting reading analog values. PWM for pulse width modulation. There's an I two C um, class. I need to give it some pins to run the I2C on, but I can commit create an I2C bus and I can say I2C.read or write um, or scan for devices. So it has full support for, well, it has lots of support for all of these fancy microcontroller features that I showed you in that diagram a while ago. Um, so, yeah, yeah, I'm, okay, I'm happy to finish now and uh, yeah, take questions. So thanks for, thanks for yeah, listening. <laughs> Just to make things easy, I might just put this microphone in the microphone stand. So if you want to ask questions, if you can just line up behind the microphone, that'll make sure we capture the questions. Any questions? If you want to ask a question, if you can just come here, you can talk directly into the microphone. Thanks for the talk. Um, how do you go using just common libraries off the net on MicroPython? Are there, are there many patterns that people use that often blow up in MicroPython land? Okay, so that's a good question. Um, so I, I should emphasize MicroPython is, it's Python 3, not Python 2. Um, and it's about, yay, it's, <laughs> it's about, uh, it's Python 3.4 and a half. It's, we're gradually adding 3.5 features. Um, but it's, it's, it implements 100% of the syntax and a lot of the built-in types, you know, well, all the built-in types, most of their methods. But the libraries, it only has a very small subset of those. So, and it really depends on what board you're running on as to how much you have available. Um, there's usually always sys and os and struct and gc and a few of the really core things. But if you want something like request, or well, you know, like HTTP or you know, some it's a fancy module, it's probably not going to be there. We're slowly re-implementing all Python modules in MicroPython to be more micro-ish, so to run efficiently. Um, but if you just went to the net and you pulled some uh, library, if it was written in pure Python and it used libraries that already existed in MicroPython, it should work. You know, that, that's, that's our aim. If it doesn't, it's a bug and you know, report it. But a pure Python library should just work in MicroPython. Whether or not you have enough memory to run it is another question. There is the, the Unix version of MicroPython which you can use to test things and which you can give mega or gigabytes of memory to. So, you, you know, you can do a lot of stuff on your PC with it as well. Um, but yeah, that, that's the answer. If it's pure Python, it should work. Other questions? Hi, uh, can you touch a little bit on the bootstrapping process? If you wanted to deploy a product running on this, uh, how would you get your code onto it, you get the libraries onto it, get it all started, make it so that when you apply okay. power, it all turns on and runs? I think that's in the next talk. Is this right? Yeah. Okay, so yes, that will be in the next talk. But um, so yeah, I will leave it to, the to Nick, the next speaker. But that's a good question because it's, yeah, definitely you want to get started with this. Other questions? Uh, how do you go interfacing with C, and can you use C types or CFFI? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, so there is UC type. There is all MicroPython libraries start with a U to indicate that they are a microized version. So there's UC types, which allows you to do that kind of interface with C data structures. There's also the FFI module, which is uh, using the FFI library for foreign function interface. So you can actually, uh, well, not on the ESP, but on uh, Linux you can load any dynamic library and, and attach bindings. 
So I actually used it in one of my physics projects. MicroPython was used as sort of the front end to script a very sophisticated um, quantum field theory simulator. So it could call C and C++ functions. So you can use dynamic uh, libraries. If you want to make your own sort of module, like a machine module to do I.O., yeah, if you just write it in C, and then there's a few little thin macro wrappers that we have, which turn C code into a Pyth MicroPython module. So it's, 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 it's made to be very easy to do that, and also to call Python from within C, so to go both ways, essentially. Thanks. Yeah. If there's no more questions, we might end the session there. We could have another round of applause for Damien. Thank you.